What happens when people are born with scamming in their bones? They can't help but just try the wildest schemes to separate people from their money. Let's start with number five. Pretend billionaire, real prison. Justin Costello claimed he was a billionaire and he threatened to make cops pay for trying to arrest him. But Justin Costello was not a billionaire. Justin Costello was a con man. And Justin Costello conned businesses and investors into thinking he was rich. The first time our fake billionaire got in trouble with the law, he was drunk. Costello was at a lodge and spa, and according to staff members, he got into a drunken rant and started harassing employees. He told them that he was a billionaire and that he could do anything he wished to them, Montgomery Burns style. Costello's rants were so expressive and confident that staff members truly believed that he was a billionaire and could make good on his threats. They were so threatened that they decided that only the police could deal with their drunken high value customer. When the police arrived, Justin continued to wave his fake billionaire story in their faces. The police didn't care about that and warned him to calm down. Justin, now apparently believing his own story, felt his pretend billionaire status gave him the right to ignore the very real police, and he approached one of them with a clenched fist. <laughs> apparently, Justin Costello also fights like Mr. Burns, so things were over pretty quickly, and he got arrested. Despite being cuffed, Justin continued to threaten the officers. He told the police that arresting him would cost them a lot of money and that they needed to uncuff him so he could punch their lights out. It didn't really seem like a good reason to take his cuffs off, so they did not comply. Instead, the police ignored his ramblings because that's what they generally do to drunk people. However, threatening a police officer is an actual crime and our fake billionaire was eventually booked for the very real crime of obstruction and harassment. He was convicted and ordered to complete 40 hours of community service. Costello was also ordered to avoid consuming alcohol and drugs for a year and banned from contacting witnesses or the lodge. Despite this, Justin didn't relent on his claims about being a billionaire. His lawyer even backed up his claims and told the prosecuting lawyer that Justin was a Harvard graduate who was rich enough to pay off witnesses. The second time the police caught our wannabe billionaire, he wasn't lucky enough to escape with just community service. This time, Costello was facing an indictment of charges related to serious fraud, and these charges carried very long sentences. So Justin did what any fake billionaire would do. He ran away. His plan was simple. He would take all his wealth and just leave the country. He had six gold bars worth around $12,000, Mexican pesos worth $10,000, and US cash around $60,000. Unfortunately for him, his plan didn't quite work. The FBI was on the case, and Costello was captured about an hour and a half from Mexico's border. When he was captured, he told the police that he didn't surrender to the court system as agreed because he'd recently had a stroke and was trying to recover. Sure, Justin, sure. After his arrest, the prosecutors on his case told the court that he needed to be held without bail because this billionaire was a flight risk. And Justin was like, Psh, nah, while staring at the door. Once Justin was in jail and his trial started, details about his fraudulent actions were revealed. He lied to several investors that he was a billionaire, Harvard graduate, an Iraq war veteran who owned a hedge fund with over a billion in management. Honestly, being all of that doesn't just make him a billionaire investor. It also makes him Batman. Costello's lies were so effective that he managed to scam about 29 investors of around $25 million in total. He also used around $40,000 of investor funds to throw a lavish wedding party for himself. In the end, Justin's lies couldn't save him. He was eventually hit with a 25 count indictment in Washington state. His trial is still set to be scheduled, but he faces up to 40 years in prison and up to $5 million in fines. That should be pocket change for our fake billionaire, right? Number four, no more bluffs. Bill Giordano is a professional poker player who managed to set up a Ponzi scheme that defrauded people of over $72 million. But he didn't do this alone. He had, alongside him, a former Scoresby accountant called Robert Zaya, and they both carried out a fraud of gigantic proportions. Giordano and Zaya didn't just burn customers by defrauding them. They also burned them by pleading guilty to their charges and avoiding trial. The entire fraud scheme couldn't have been successful without insider help from the Commonwealth 
bank. The guilty pleas of the card dealing and Ponzi scheming duo meant that victims will never really know the role the bank played in building this fraudulent house of cards. The fraud was simple. Robert Zaya would use his connection to scout for wealthy clients and Giordano would forge documents in those clients' names to request excessive loans that the clients could not pay off. The only way that Giordano could have ever gotten away with this play was if he had contacts at the bank who approved his forged documents, which he did. One such contact was Brendan Epps, who was described as the inside man. However, Epps died of a brain aneurysm way back in 2007, and after his death, Giordano had to forge other contacts at the bank. One of the plays that Giordano and Zaya made was on Jim Barker and his wife Debbie. Jim made only $80,000 per year, but suddenly discovered that his loan application document mentioned that he made $343,000 at the time, and this document had been used to apply for a loan of $1.5 million, which was impossible for Jim to finance. Jim wasn't particularly happy to hear that he'd gotten into perpetual debt because of fraud, so he reported the case to the Commonwealth Bank. The bank's assessment analysis read the report and agreed that yes, it was indeed a fraud. The plan was to report the fraud to the police and let them take it from there. However, the bank only made the report four years later when the entire scheme was already unraveling. Meanwhile, the bakers had to sell their home to finance fraudulent loan that Giordano had gotten on their behalf. So what did these two fraudsters spend all their money on while literally forcing people to lose their homes? Well, let's just say they lived like kings. Robert Zaya siphoned around $26 million into his family's trust. As one would expect, both Giordano and Zaya used the money to fund private gambling meetups and expensive trips to Las Vegas and Macau. The duo also bought a fleet of luxury cars, a jet ski, Harley Davidson motorcycles, and even owned a speedboat named Bad Boys. Even for fraudsters, that's a little bit on the nose. In the end, the scheme unraveled and the bad boys eventually had to face the law. And the law treated them like the bad boys they were. They were faced with 142 counts of fraud and eventually had to plead guilty. Giordano was sentenced to 12 years in prison and Zaya got 10 years for his efforts as well. Number three, property wars. Scott Minaj is a former star of Property Wars. If you didn't know, Property Wars is a reality TV show on Discovery Channel. Aside from being a reality TV star, Minaj also happened to be quite the property warlord. However, instead of winning Property Wars for his clients, he just stole from them. And after years of stealing from his clients, Minaj was eventually caught by the police and pled guilty to multiple counts of fraud, money laundering, and even identity theft. Minaj operated a real estate firm whose business was to use loans to invest in real estate. But instead of investing, he embezzled about 30 million bucks. Minaj, whose name sounds like it's in past tense, used the embezzled cash to support a lavish lifestyle. He traveled a lot, bought luxury vehicles, and purchased million dollar homes. Vladimir Minaj had spent so much money lavishly that he ran out of money and could no longer access more loans. Ordinarily, when someone is faced with a complete disaster, they typically stop doing the dumb things that got them into the mess. But Minaj wasn't that kind of man. He was already used to the trappings of a royal lifestyle, so he decided to get even more hardcore with his fraud. He built an elaborate identity theft scheme and started using the identities of recently deceased individuals to send credit applications from his furniture store. Stores. The loans were never used to purchase any furniture, and Minaj just managed to spend it all. He allegedly caused banks around $2 million in losses through this ruse. In the end, it took an organization of government agencies to take our property warlord down. Minaj only got caught when the Department of Homeland Security, Homeland Security Investigations, and Internal Revenue Service criminal investigations got involved. In court, Minaj had an impressive rap sheet. He was charged with bank fraud, aggravated identity theft, and money laundering. The court heard that he defrauded up to 200 victims and he was ordered to pay up to $33.5 million as restitution to these victims. He also got a 17-year prison sentence for his war crimes. In any case, it's sort of ironic that a real estate investor will have only one room and one bed to call home for the next 17 years. Number two, Bordeaux Cellars. Stephen Burton and Andrew Fuller ran a scheme where they defrauded a bunch of investors with a loan scheme that was collateralized by wine. 
yes, it sounds weird to us too, but it happened. Before we dive into this scheme, let's talk about the perpetrators. Who are Stephen Burton and James Wellesley? The duo had a criminal history before now, and these new charges aren't their first taste of the law's vintage 22. Stephen Fuller, for one, was sentenced to six years in prison in 2013 after he admitted to charges, including fraud and forgery, over a property scheme. The duo also faced civil charges relating to fraud the year before they were recently arrested. They were found guilty in that judgment and had to pay 56 million pounds in restitution to their victims. But the present charges they face are criminal, and they are unlikely to get away with a fine. Both men ran a business called Bordeaux Cellars, where they made outrageous promises to their investors, claiming that they would get a 12% quarterly interest rate on their investments. These funds would be lent to wealthy borrowers who needed cash, and the cash would be backed by expensive wines. The loans, they said, would be worth just 35% of the wine's value, so lenders would easily get their money back if any borrower defaulted. However, there was one tiny problem. There were no borrowers and there was no expensive wine. In the end, the criminal fake wine hoarding duo was able to scam investors of almost a hundred million dollars. The business plan made no sense if you thought about it. Why would a person rich enough to own dozens of cases of the most expensive wines want to get loans at 16% interest? People with that much money definitely had better options. Burton said he'd gotten the idea for the scam from a Sunday Times article where he read that a man lent billionaires short-term loans and they gave him their luxury vehicles as collateral. The only difference was that Burton had copied a legal business model and had made it into a Frankenstein monster of an illegal one. In the end, the scam was uncovered when in 2019, the payments of quarterly interest to Bordeaux sellers' lenders abruptly stopped. All it took was one investor having his lawyer do some research. The lawyer looked up the business and found little evidence of trading activity and no audited records. This discovery set off a chain of events that led to the police investigating the whole scheme. Burton and Fuller were able to get their hands on a total of 76 million pounds from investors. Fuller was eventually arrested and is currently behind bars. Burton, on the other hand, was also arrested but was released due to COVID concerns. Despite currently serving a four-year sentence, he fled the country and is currently still on the lam. Number 1. The Crypto King Self-described crypto king, Aiden Platursky, scammed investors out of millions of dollars intended for crypto and foreign exchange investments. This young Canadian crypto king deceived his subjects, including Diane Moore, who was referred to Platersky by a longtime friend. She wanted to invest the $60,000 she had set aside for her grandchildren's education. Moore's investment would have a 70-30 split on any gains, meaning she would get 70%, and King Platursky would receive the other 30%. In her contract, it stated that her investment would target gains of 10 to 20% every two weeks, and she would be repaid her entire initial investment in full if any of it was lost. Moore ended up becoming one of the 29 creditors involved in a bankruptcy proceeding against Platursky after he lost her grandchildren's money. A fraud recovery law firm began investigating Platursky and called out for information about him. The founder of Investigation Council PC, Norman Groot, was shocked by the response they received. Around 140 40 people who invested a total of $20 million responded. Investors participated in the same 70-30% split as more, and their goal was 10-20% to growth bi-weekly. However, the interest rate of 5% a week was unrealistic in the open market. While investors struggled to recover their lost money, His Majesty Platursky enjoyed an extravagant lifestyle fit for the crypto king he self-described as. He owned 11 vehicles, including two McLarens, two BMWs, and a Lamborghini and flew on private jets. The rent for his lakefront mansion was $45,000 a month. Platursky marketed himself through paid-for promotional articles where he'd talk about his success using crypto to buy and sell in-game items in video games. The articles would list his credentials, including investing in Bitcoin early. As he watched it grow in popularity, Platursky capitalized on the growing stock and maximized the return on his investment. The articles also spoke about Platursky's plans to start his own company, using his vast knowledge of the crypto industry to help investors obtain the same success as him. Investors questioned Platursky for more than five hours during a creditor's meeting. They demanded to know why His Majesty kept investing money when he couldn't repay current investors. The king's excuse was that he was just a kid, like uh, King Joffrey, but 50% less evil and with 100% less beheading, so there's that. Platursky's lawyers said the claims against his client were exaggerated. Platursky had never actually solicited money from investors. Instead, people saw how successful 
successful he was when he invested in crypto as a teenager and wanted to recreate the same success. Platursky's lawyer pointed out that none of the investors considered that the crypto market is volatile and a young Platursky probably needed to be better qualified to handle their investments. Essentially, blaming the victims for trusting him because that's always been a solid legal defense. Despite his lawyer's claims that it was the victim's own fault, Platursky clearly deceived investors. He provided them with pictures and videos of statements from a foreign exchange crypto platform showing that he had $311 million in his business account. However, an investor reached out to the trading platform and notified them that Platursky in his business didn't have royal coffers filled with those funds. It's unlikely that investors will get their money back, and some used a line of credit for their investments. Apart from the bankruptcy, their other legal option would be to report Platursky to the Ontario Securities Commission and the police. Platursky was almost arrested twice after refusing to hand over his diamond-studded Rolex, Audi, and cell phone to a bankruptcy trustee in efforts to recoup some of the $25 million Platursky allegedly owes 119 investors. Threats of arrest were necessary to deal with Platursky's alleged lack of cooperation ever since the Ontario Superior Court of Justice declared him bankrupt. While claiming bankruptcy, His Highness was still driving a car worth $150,000 while wearing a diamond-studded Rolex that he refused to offer up to the trustee. Even with his assets seized, only $2 million of the $25 million has been recovered, and Platursky's friends and family aren't being very cooperative either. With over $23 million still unaccounted for, it seems that Platursky is actively hiding his money, though the trustee is attempting to subpoena bank records of various wire transactions. Unfortunately, the money recovered won't be distributed for a while, and the amount returned to investors will most likely be far less than what is owed. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what percentage of crypto projects you think are just complete scams.